Hey friends, listen up, check it out. Why does my bee buzz? Let's find out. Hey everybody, welcome back to the workbench. Today I have a King B2 microphone and this bee buzzes. It's a bee that buzzes. Buzzy, buzzy bee, bee buzz. We're gonna take it apart and we're gonna fix it. But if you'd rather watch me play a bootleg video game, I have a link up here in the corner in case you missed it. So this microphone has a terrible 60 hertz buzz. It's usually always present and it gets way worse when you touch it on the body, but it doesn't really affect it if you touch it up here or on the top. If you have the same problem, first of all, go ahead and talk to Neat Customer Service because they've been very helpful. But if you find yourself with a buzzing microphone and a replacement is not an option, then I'm gonna show you how to take it apart and fix the issue. I also have a working microphone that we can compare to see what the differences are, and then things are gonna get really out of hand. So microphone number three is one they told me was good when they sent it, but I'm not so sure this one's gonna hold up. So we're gonna do a teardown, I'm gonna show you what's inside and how to fix it. First, let's get these pop filters out of the way. There we go. These are harder to pull off than they look. Now for external differences, there's really not much to speak of. The fronts are all pretty much the same. The backs are all pretty much the same. The one difference that they have is on the XLR connector. Now sample number one, I ordered the first day it was available from Amazon. Sample number one has no serial number on it anywhere. If you look, you just have the pins labeled one, two, three. Sample number two has a serial number printed inside the XLR connection with a little barcode. Sample number three also has a serial number inside the XLR port. Now, I'm not sure that the serial numbers are sequential for NEAT, but the serial number on sample number three is about 225 lower than on sample number two. It's pretty straightforward to take apart one of these microphones. You just grab it by the base and unscrew it. Now, I'm also going to show you what the capsules look like, but if you're following along, you don't need to do this part. You have one, two, three screws along the top. The capsule is held in place by this rubbery triangle, which should help isolate it from handling noise. Now let's take a look at the other side. There you go. It might be hard to see, but number one and three have these sort of similar dirty sections on them. Also, there's a cutout for a capacitor, but neither number one nor number three has it in there. On number two, the capacitor is in place and the dirty sections are not there. From the front, all the circuit boards look about the same. They're all labeled King B underscore two top 07.10.2020, which is probably when the board was designed. They each have three WEMA capacitors. Why my capacitors? So on microphone number two, we have this odd man out for this center capacitor. It's the same capacitance between all three, but the one on number two is rated to 100 volts DC. It's rated 300 volts AC on one and three. I don't think this should be a problem because you can overrate on voltage all you want on capacitors. And usually the DC rating is a lot higher than the AC rating. So if anything, I think these capacitors are just overrated and more expensive. It doesn't even look like it was designed to fit in there in the first place. So if I had to guess, they probably designed it for the capacitor in number two, but due to supply chain problems, they had to use an alternative in number one and three. Everything else looks pretty similar. Something that's also interesting is that microphone number one has a blue, green, and red cable, while two has blue, yellow, and red, and then three has blue, green, and red again. So between the wire and the capacitors, I'd say that number one and number three have more in common than number one and number two. What other differences are there? Well, let's look at the quality of the paint. If you look at this area on number one, that's all nicely painted. Number two, it's also nicely painted, although I'm seeing some little bubbles in it that I don't think is in the paint, I think it's in the casting of the metal. Number three is not nicely painted. It has some overspray, but that's pretty much it. Why do I even care about the paint? So this microphone will buzz when I touch here on the side, but not up here on top, meaning that electrically these two parts are not connected to each other. The top is molded into the body of the microphone, which is connected to ground through this XLR connector here, specifically through this little screw. If the side part of the body is not connected to the top, that means the side part of the body is not grounded, and it needs to be. Radio waves are everywhere all the time, and this body needs to be a Faraday cage, so it needs to be a conductive material with a clean path to ground. Basically, the paint is acting as an insulator, which is leaving the body of the microphone floating instead of connected to ground. So I think the most important difference between the working and non-working microphone is the quality of the paint. And one of the most important areas I think is on this end cap here. You can see on microphone number two, they've gone through a lot of effort to make sure this is shiny and clean. On microphone number one, it's mostly painted over. So all you really have to do to fix this problem is to sand off some of this paint and make sure there's a good connection between this end cap and the body. So that's what we're gonna do now. I've got some 150 grit sandpaper, but you can use whatever you want and a wire brush, and we're just gonna clean up the connections. There's a fair amount of overspray on these threads. I'm going to try to get off with this wire brush. We're just going to sand this ridge here at the end a little bit. If you're having trouble with the sandpaper, you can also use a file or scrape it off with the corner of a utility knife. The important thing is to get good contact. Okay, once you've got the end cap looking nice and clean, take a look at the body and you can see there's some paint on the inside of it as well. So we're going to clean that up too. Nice and shiny. 
I'm also going to clean up the inside of the top so we can try and get good contact on both sides. And of course you've got to get it on both sides. And that's all you need to do to fix the problem. So let's put this back together and give it a test. It worked. All right, that's all there is to it. And it looks like that worked out pretty well. Hopefully you found this interesting or helpful. If you did, let me know. If you hated it, let me know. If you have this problem or if you have ideas for future videos, let me know in the comments. And as always,